Um, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the second series of our um, online um, webinars. Um, thanks to everyone who attended the last one. For everyone um, not really familiar with AFBE, we're Association for BAME, BAME, BAME Engineers. And what we do is we create a, an engagement between um, young professionals and um, not just young professionals, every professional really, and um, you know students as well. Um, today we've got a, a fantastic guest for us, um, Titi. Um, one of my um, scariest moments in school was basically going to the to the chemistry class, and um, Titi has been kind enough today to educate us uh, um, about chemistry. And before we start, really, um, I think it will be good to have an icebreaker. Um, the icebreaker today basically is if everyone could use the chat box to basically um, tell us one activity they've sort of developed um, during, or they've enjoyed doing while working at home. Anything from, I don't know, doing yoga or doing some press ups, anything. So if anyone could just, everyone could just kindly um, use the chat box to um, tell us one activity they've been doing. Bacon, I'm a fan of bacon as well. What about yourself, Titi? Yeah, yeah so <laughs> I've been doing like DIY projects around the house. Um, okay. So for example, I, yeah, just mixed up like butter and or for body butter. Um, okay. It didn't quite turn out well, but um, at least I'm sure that, you know, I wouldn't have ashy skin. <laughs> <laughs> if the slowdown continues, yes. Yeah, so. really? well, I think one thing I've been doing, uh, being a, a funny person, I've been developing my comedy skills. So I've been learning new jokes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, I'll hand it over to you, um, Titi. Right, okay, thank you very much. Um, so, hello everyone. Um, thank you, Sam, and um, for the introduction. My name is Titi, and I'm a chemical engineer. I currently work as a safety engineer, and I also um, volunteer with AFB. Um, so, AFB, just to give a brief overview, AFB is basically geared towards helping um, black and minority engineers to understand better what higher achievements they can um, make. So through different projects, through different activities such as um, transition, real event, real projects and uh, making engineering hot. So we work from like undergrads to, um, sorry, from, from students to like um, career professionals and up to whatever level. So, um, yeah, and this this basically, like Sam said, is a good way for us to um, get in touch with everyone, um, given the current situation of things, so we can still connect with each other or with one another while still being in a lockdown situation. So today we'll be connecting through chemistry, and I thought that a good um, it would be good to sort of zero in on a topic. So I've looked, I'm going to be talking about acids and bases today. Like I said, today we'll be talking about acids and bases. Um, so what we're going to cover today will be a definition. So definitions are a good way to start learning about anything. And then we'll also be looking at pH indicators. Um, we'll be looking at what the difference is between strong and weak acids and bases. So when we say an acid or a base is strong and weak, what does that mean? Um, as compared to when we say it's dilute or concentrated. So we'll be looking, we'll also be looking at a quick demonstration. There's lots of colors involved. So I quite like this one actually. Um, the, and then we'll look at some GCSE questions. And if you've got any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer. And then just some further resources as well. Um, if you'd like to continue learning about this. Um, so I'll just, oops, sorry. Um, right, okay. So acids are, so basically to define what an acid is, is anything that is able to, any, any compound that is able to produce hydrogen ions in aqueous solution. That's basically when it's dissolved in water. So for example, if you've got hydrochloric acid and it's dissolved in water, it's going to dissociate or ionize. That's basically becoming, that, that's basically what that means is you're forming a positive ion, which is the hydrogen ion, and the chloride ion, which is the negative ion as well. So um, because of the production of the hydrogen ions, the values of the pH values are usually less than seven. So then if we talk about what a base is, that's any substance that reacts with an acid to form 
is stored and water only. So examples that we could have are metal oxides and metal hydroxide. So for example, here we have a metal oxide, which is copper, the oxide of copper, um, reacting with an acid, which is um, um, sulfuric acid to form your copper sulfate and water. So copper sulfate is a salt and you've got water um, in the solution as well. So you could also have a hydroxide, metal hydroxide, which in this case is the magnesium um, hydroxide reacting with hydrochloric acid to form a salt, which is magnesium chloride and water as well. So these are just examples of bases. So anything that's able to react with the acids to form a salt and water um, product only is what we would call a base. Um, feel free to use the chat button to put in any questions and I'll be able to pick them up as well with um, hopefully some help with me. Yeah, okay. So then we have, um, so some, as we have, so having discussed what the base is, then if we look at what the, which, a subset of these bases or these compounds which we discussed before, which are alkalis because they dissolve in water to form alkaline solutions. So for example, we could have um, copper oxide, which is a base, but it's not an alkali because it's, in, it's insoluble in water. We could also have, um, but on the other hand, we also have sodium hydroxide. So these are two that we looked at before. Um, that dissolves in water, so it's also an alkali. So anything that's able to dissolve in water as well, that is soluble in water is what we would call um, an alkali, basically. And then these then produce hydroxide ions when they are dissolved in water. So an example is the sodium hydroxide, which then forms sodium ion, which is positive, and the hydroxide ion, which is negative as well. And um, al alkaline solutions have pH that are greater than seven. So that's what we'll be looking at um, later, or a bit later on, just to see what we mean by less than seven, greater than seven, and all of that. So just to then go back to, you know, having discussed what acids and bases or alkalis are, and um, what happens when you bring them together. So we've said before that it becomes, it, becomes salt, it forms a salt and water. So basically what is happening there is that the hydrogen ion from the acids and the hydroxide ion from the base is coming together to form or is reacting to form um, water, which is a liquid. Um, these are then formed, obviously, and that, that's, that's called a neutralization reaction, basically. So if you add the right amount of acid and alkali together, you get a neutral solution. Um, because the salt as well is, you know, a neutral compound as well. So a neutral solution is neither acidic nor alkaline. So what we mean by right amount in this case is that, you know, if you, obviously if you put in too many, too much, too, a too high amount of acid or too high amount of alkali, you have excess of that and the overall solution would probably be acidic or alkaline depending on what you have excess of in that case. So we, we'll see more about that when we look into um, sample GCSE questions. And so we have that a neutral solution also has a pH of seven. And examples of neutral solutions will be, for example, our water, um, distilled water. So sometimes um, the water that you get out of your tap might not necessarily be um, at a pH of seven, but um, depending on what you know is in the pipes, and maybe for example, even if you have um, water from you have like water from the atmosphere, for example, like in form of rain. So depending on what pollutants or you know gases that you have in the in the in the atmosphere, you could have something that is called acid rain, and that's because you have like acidic acid, um, gases that when they form when they have when they react with water, they form like a slightly acidic solution. So um, the pH scale now. I'll just talk about the pH scale. Um, sorry, okay. So the pH of the solution can be measured using a pH probe or using indicators or a color chart. So what the pH probe essentially does is to give just, you know, it gives, re it gives real numbers or it gives exact numbers just because of, um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an instrument that does that. But if you don't have the instrument, you can also use that, an indicator, which you then compare with a color chart, basically, that lets you know 
what um, colors you should be expecting depending on the acidity or alkalinity of a solution. So when we talk about the pH of a solution, basically it's the measure of the concentration of hydrogen ions for an acidic solution. So the higher the concentration of acidic, um, the higher the concentration of hydrogen ions in the acidic solution, the lower the pH. And also if it's for an alkaline solution, the higher the concentration of the hydroxide ions in an alkaline solution, the higher the pH is. So examples of pH indicators will be phenolphthalein, methyl orange, litmus paper, depending on you know which one. And these are used depending on what sort of acids and alkalis you are trying to um, react together. So we would then look at just to okay. I think just to, I don't know what's going on, sorry. Okay, yeah, right. So here we can see as well that we have this, um, this chart as well that shows, so you, a, a, an acid that has, for example, a pH of six is less acidic than an acid that has a pH of one. So you really don't want to, you know, maybe be ingesting something that has a pH of one because that's not going, that's going to be too acidic or, you know, that's something that you should treat with care. Um, compared with, say, for example, um, you know, something that's six. So we have at pH of seven is our water. So something between six, some a pH with a solution with a pH of six is slightly acidic, and a pH of eight is slightly alkaline. And so the same thing occurs here. The higher the pH for an alkaline, the higher the you know the alkalinity of the the um, solution. So. Um, so now we'll talk about dilute and dilute and concentrated solutions. So basically when we talk about solutions, you have a solute that is dissolved in a solvent to form a solution. So for example, if you take your table salt at home, which is your, um, it's your sodium chloride, and then you put that in some water. So your solute is your um, salt granules and your solvent is your water. And when you mix that together, it forms a solution, which is your salt water solution. Same with your sugar or whatever it is that you can um, see around your house. So the concentration of the solution is, is the measure of how much solute you put into the solution. So say, for example, you have maybe one cup of water and you keep adding salt into it. The higher the amount of salt, maybe you start with one tablespoon and you start to put two tablespoons, three tablespoons, the higher the concentration, the higher the amount of salt that you're putting into it, the higher the concentration of the solution. And so when you say, so say for example, if you put only one tablespoon of salt into a big jug of water, that's obviously going to be more dilute than maybe one tablespoon of salt to um, one third cup of water in, in the solution. So that's basically, the, that's what that means by, that's what we mean by dilute and concentrated solutions. Come on, please. Okay. So the way I've done it, you can't see you. <laughs> then look at on the other strong and weak acids. So we've talked about the fact that uh, the acids in, so what defines what makes an acid and yeah. acid the, the presence of hydrogen ions. Strong acids are acids that are able to completely dissociate in solution. So what that means is, as we can see here, yeah. that there's no, there's really no going back. Basically, in, in this reaction, um, you see that the hydrogen chloride is able to dissociate completely or ionize completely into hydrogen and chloride. But on the other hand, um, your weak acid, for example. Um, this is ethanoic acid, and it then it's a reversible reaction, which is shown by this um, reversible reaction sign, forward and backward reaction. So what that means is that depending on maybe the temperature or the pressure or you know other things that could affect the equilibrium of this reaction, this reaction could either go to the hydro to forming for, to more molecules forming hydrogen and ethanoate ions 
or these combining as well back into ethanoic acid. So they are only, so basically they are not, they are not resolute or they are not, you know, they, they haven't made up their minds basically whether they are going into, whether they're going to stay together or they're going to dissociate. So that's the difference. Whereas for strong acids, they're strong, you know, they've said to themselves, we're going apart and that's, that's, that's all that, um, that's a very straightforward reaction. So basically that's, that's the difference between strong and weak acids and dilute, so compared with dilute, diluted or concentrated solutions. So again, examples of bases, so strong bases, for example, potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide will go straight into the formation of um, either the potassium ion on, or the sodium ion and the hydroxide ions, and this is what makes them you know, basic in nature. Um, on the other hand, we've got ammonia that would then, you know, react with water in the presence of water it will go into um, ammonium ion and hydroxide ion but again it's a reversible reaction so it could go either way depending on temperature or pressure so now we come to the demonstration so i've just done a bit of back work um, beforehand and this is the cabbage the remains of my cabbage i took a bit of it and i was able to put some hot water into the cabbage solution into the cab. To, I, okay, so I first of all shredded the cabbage um, quite as tiny as I could. Well, not as tiny, but into smaller um, strips. And I poured some water into it to form this solution. I don't know if you can see it. So this is my solution. So I've got this. This was the. This is the red. The the solution I got from the red cabbage, basically. So it's got some pigments in it, which are called anthocyanins, which obviously then change solution, they change color depending on what um, solutions you put into it. So that's why we are able to use it as a, an indicator. So it's similar to maybe in schools, we could probably be more used to methyl orange or phenophthalene or whatever. But this is also something that we can kind of make at home and just, you know, use it to see different things. So that's the color. And when I added the lemon juice, uh, yeah, lemon juice, I got this color as well. Um, so this is pink and obviously it's different from this color that we have here. Um, I've also just done beforehand, I did um, the, okay, so I used apple cider vinegar as well, and you're able to get this color as well. So it's slightly less pink. So these are, these are I would say it's may, maybe more of, a, these are, yeah, similar acids anyway, but they have, so that's why we have similar colors as well. Um, so next thing would be, for example, to put some water. So like we said, water should be most, should usually be about seven. It might be slightly acidic or alkaline depending on what it encounters in our pipes as we go along. So I'm just going to add some water and we see that it doesn't really change color as much. So that's quite neutral. So it doesn't do anything to the indicator. Um, the next one that I will do is I've got, so here I've got um, bicarbonate of soda, which is also baking soda or baking soda as well, yeah. And then I'm just going to add that into, um, well, in this case I can add, whichever one I can add it into it. So here we can see that it's forming a blue greenish color, which is, you know, Quite different so so obviously it's telling us that that's different from it's different from what we got from the acids for example and I will then go into using another example is um, household cleaner so this has got ammonia inside of it so this is my household cleaner and I've put some in here so I'm just going to add it in as well and so you can see as well that it's changing color into some sort of greenish, ooh, I don't know if you can see, but it's changed color into some sort of light darker blue than you know the green that we got from the bicarbonate of soda. 
So this is just, you know, a few things. There are other things that you can look at in, in the house, detergents, shampoo, soaps. So you can just play around with those as well. Obviously, not with um to take care of, take to take care when you're using concentrated solutions as well at home. Um but that, that just shows different colors that you can get as well. So I'll just go back to sharing my screen. So we're just going to some GCSE questions that I've gone, uh, I've been able to, I thought would, would be good for us to tackle. And that would give us like a good breath of different things that we could look into. So um, concerning acids and bases. So the question is all alkalis contain the same iron. So what's the formula of this iron? And so from what we've discussed before, We've seen that, you know, um, if hydrogen ions are contained in acids and sodium ions might be in, depending on, it could be in both acids and bases, depending on, you know, what, sorry, it, could, it would be mostly in bases, but not, it's not common to all, all bases. You could have different things. So the, the answer would be hydroxide ions, because that is what makes an alkali, an alkali, basically. So that's the answer for that one. Um, so the next question would be talking about, so here we have a solution of sodium hydroxide, which is an alkali, and we are told that it has a concentration of 40 grams per dm cube. And so we are asked to find what mass of sodium hydroxide would be contained in 250 centimeter cube of the solution. So one thing that we always need to be careful of when we're looking at questions that need to um, that we need to solve it with or solve some so um, we need to solve for like for example in this case the mass of sodium hydroxide is that we have to make sure that our units are consistent. So if we look at that, what, what, when we say that the solution of sodium hydroxide has a concentration of 40 grams per dm cube, what we're saying is that if we had one dm cube of the solution, it means that we've got 40 grams of that sodium hydroxide dissolved in it. So we need to then be careful because we are then asked for the mass of sodium hydroxide in 250 centimeter cube of the solution. And so we need to, but we need to be consistent with, between centimeter cubes and, decim and decimeter cubes. So what we need to do is to find the relationship. So we know that 1,000 centimeter cubes make up one decimeter cube or one cubic decimeter. So we can then do a conversion to say that 250 centimeter cube would be 0 0.25 decimeter cube here. And so we're able to then relate that with the fact that one decimeter cube contains 40 grams of sodium hydroxide. And so we're able to do that by saying that 0 0.25 um, cubic decimeter would contain 40 times 0 0.25 grams, which is equal to 10 grams of sodium hydroxide. So that's basically what we are asked for in this case, and we're able to you know, get the mass from that calculation. Okay. Um, the next question is talking about dilute hydro, hydrochloric acid being a strong acid. To so explain why an acid can be described as both strong and dilute. So like we discussed before, the strength of an acid is dependent on the degree of ionization in aqueous solution. So a hydrochloric acid, whether dilute or concentrated, is still a strong acid because hydrochloric acid will always completely ionize in water. And um, dilute acid, on the other hand, talking about saying that an acid is dilute means is the amount of the solute that is, you know, dissolved in the, in the volume of a solution. So when you have a dilute acid, you have a very small amount of that acid in a per unit volume of the solution. So that's how we can come about saying that an acid is both strong and dilute. Okay, so the next question, we see that a student has titrated some 25 cm cube um, portions of dilute sulfuric acid with a given concentration of sodium hydroxide. And we can see the student's results. So we can see that the, the student has carried out the titration five times and the volume of hydroxide, sodium hydroxide solution is given in, you know, for each of the titration 
um, runs. And we're also given the equation for the reaction. Um, so two moles of sodium hydroxide will react with one mole of sulfuric acid to form sodium sulfide, um, yeah, so sodium sulfide and um, water as well. So to calculate the concentration, so we are being asked to calculate the concentration of the sulfuric acid in mole per dm cube. And we are asked to also use only the student's concordant results. And we are given the definition of concordant results as those that are within 0 0.1 cubic centimeters of each other. So the next thing that we, so the first thing that we need to do is to determine what, which, which are concordant results. So of course, when we've done some tri titration runs, so depending on, um, usually you can, as you can see anyway, from this first titration, usually you tend to overshoot the end point. And so what that means is possibly, you know, you're not expecting, especially because you've put in, you know, some, um, some indicator into the, into the, the alkali solution, you might not be expecting the end point. So the first one is usually quite rough and then you're able to find out as you go along more, um, more accurate results. So anyway, we can see from here that the, the ones, the results that are within 0 0.1 cm cube of each other are um, the third, the fourth and the fifth titrations. And so we are then able to use those as an average. So we take those three values and find the average of that of those three values and we get to 22.13 cubic centimeters. And of course it would be good for us to also convert that into cubic decimeters because our concentration of sodium hydroxide is given in mole per dm cube. So the next thing that we need to do is to use the relationship that number of moles is equal to the concentration times the volume. So for the sodium hydroxide solution, the number of moles of number of moles will be the concentration times the volume. So basically what we're saying is as we know that the concentration is how much of that sodium hydroxide is is um, contained in one dm cube of the solution, the number of moles we will get will be the concentration times the volume. And so this is how we get, and that's how we come about this um, number of moles of sodium hydroxide. Now, the equation of the reaction tells us how much sodium hydroxide is required to, you know, um, react with one mole of the sulfuric acid. So like I was saying before, we have, um, for us to know the actual end point or to know how much to avoid getting, you know, maybe a, a slightly acidic solution because we've, um, what's it called? Because we are able to, we, we, we don't want to, you know, overshoot the end point. So what this, what, to know the end point, we know, or to know how much is required to, how much of the sodium hydroxide is required to react with the, the sulfuric acid. That's governed by the equation for the reaction. So that's how we can get that two moles of sodium hydroxide is required to react with one mole of, sulfuric acid. So the number of moles of, of the sulfuric acid that is required is going to be half of, to the number of moles of sulfuric acid that is required to react with the number of moles of sodium hydroxide, which we've been able to calculate before, will be one over two times those number of moles. And that's how we come about this figure. And so the concentration again of sodium hydroxide, which is, act, sorry, the concentration of sulfuric acid, which is actually what we're looking for, would then be the number of moles per unit volume. And so that's how we come about the number of moles of sulfuric acid times the um, 25 cm cubes. So like we were told before, the student was able to titrate 25 cm cube portions of the sulfuric acid with the sodium hydroxide solution. So that's how we come about the 25. And of course, we have to also be aware that we need to um, change that into cubic decimeters to avoid, you know, uh, wrong calculation. So that's how we come about the concentration of sulfuric acid. So hopefully that makes sense. Does anyone want me to go through something again in this? in this one because I, I, I do agree that I do appreciate that it's a lot it's a it's a lot of um 
what's it called, a lot of calculations. But does anyone want me to go through something here? I'll just stop here and check the chat. Um, oh, right, okay. Doesn't seem like there are any questions. I think there was an initial question which has been explained, um, okay. asking about what, what ions are. What does ionize mean again? Okay. Okay, so basically um, ionization means the, it's like the dissociation, I would say, into the components of, um, so for example, sodium hydroxide is a compound and it's made up of positive and a positive ion and a negative ion. So the positive ion is the sodium in this case, and the negative ion will be the hydroxide. So the fact that there's an hydroxide ion is what makes it a base. So the same thing as well with hydrogen, um, with hydro, with sulfuric acid. So it dissociates, or it's it when it ionizes into like its component parts. It's the component parts are hydrogen ions and sulf, um, sulfate ions as well. So that's how, and because it has the hydrogen ions, that's what makes it a an acid. So hope that helps. Is that yeah? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, Neri, thank you. Um, so we'll just go back to, I mean, if there are any questions on this one, we could always come back, that's fine. Um, so we're just going to the next question, which says, explain why the student should use a pipette to measure the dilute sulfuric acid and a burette to measure the sodium hydroxide solution. So if we go back, so it's, it's a follow-up question to this one. So we are told here that the student has 25 um, cubic centimeter portions of the dilute sulfuric acid and is then doing the tri titrations on and figuring out the volume of sodium hydroxide required. So um, to just to answer this, we'd say that the pipettes, we're able to use the pipettes to accurately measure a fixed volume. So because the student knows that there's a fixed volume of sulfuric acid to be used, you can use a pipette to accurately measure that. On the other hand, you have to use a burette to accurately measure a variable volume because the solution can then be released in drops. So basically, if you look at this, so this is what the, I mean, in this case, this was used for an alkali, but it can be used for anyone anyway. Um, you have, oh, sorry, no, this is right, actually. So you can use this um, to, pip, so, so you, you, a pipette has a, like a, a line where you can basically fill it up to and then you're able to then put that into your your um, conical flask so but in this case you can see as well that if you have a variable volume that is required then you put that into the burette because you're able to then use that to measure in to drop to met to release in drops into the solution and so what you'll be doing is trying to check when that color change happens inside this um, conical flask. So you obviously can use the tap to control the flow and then when you're done you know the start you know where you started from and you know where you end up so you can then calculate the volume of whether your acid or base that has been used. So that's basically how that works. Um, so yeah and then we have another question again which is a bit similar to what we've looked at before, but I just thought it would be a good idea to go through this again. So here we're saying to calculate the mass of sodium hydroxide in 30 cubic centimeters of a 0.105 mole per dm cube solution. And we're given the mass of sodium hydroxide. So just to solve it, we can see that, again, we'll be looking at the number of moles using the relationship that the number of moles is equal to the concentration times the volume. And so even, again, it would be a good, it's a good way to check if you use the um, units. So if you, if you are able to say mole per dm cube times dm cube, that gives you moles. And you can measure the number of moles. The number of moles is measured as number of, as moles, basically. So um, in this case, you can then see that the number of moles would be the concentration, which is 0 0.105 in this case, times 30, again, 30 cm cubed, but then we have to use that in cubic decimeters. And so that would be, would give us 0 0.00315 moles. 
and we are given the relative formula mass of sodium hydroxide and what that tells us when we say that so the relative formula mass of sodium hydroxide is 40 what we're saying is that one mole of sodium hydroxide weighs 40 grams and so if we know that one mole of sodium hydroxide weighs 40 grams then we know that 0 0.00315 moles would weigh this amount because that's 40 grams per mole times 0 0.0315 moles and that's how we are able to get the mass of sodium hydroxide in that solution in in the volume of a given concentration of solution so that sort of gives an overview of how we can you know go between mass and moles and relate the concentration and the volume of solution so do we have any questions basically I have a question, Titi. Yes, please go ahead. So, did the same? So, some of these principles that you've explained, do they yeah. apply to organic acids and bases, or are there any differences we should be aware of? Right. Okay. So, for organic acids and bases, um, they are. It's not a rule of thumb, but they are usually um, they are quite um, weak. I'd say, especially the acids, anyway. The, they are weak acids. So, for example, um, one is what we have in um, vinegar, for example, and it's reversible. So it only partially dissociates in solution. So we have, I'd say, I'd say they're usually quite weak acids or bases. Also, because even what we get as well in like our, our foods. So, for example, lemon comes from lemon. Lemon juice or citric acid comes from lemon. We've got same as well oranges and all of that. We've got foods that are slightly acidic or slightly basic so um but really they will be weak ones because so usually maybe from about i'll say five or six to about 10 ph so obviously because obviously we wouldn't want to you know have something really you know like bleach for example is a ph of 14 so imagine having that in like organic <laughs> or in our bodies and all of that that would probably not be um, so helpful to us and um, and we have like concentrated you know hydro um, concentrated acids as well I have pH of zero and one which is not very helpful to us so I'll say they we, we have them obviously have pH as well depending on but they are you know they have they are reversible so they I would classify most of them as weak acids but obviously there will be exceptions to the rule thank you yeah, that's fine. I do have another question, if that's okay. Yes, sure. Um, do you have any practical tips to kind of make um, chemistry revision more effective? Were there any that you practiced when you were um, at sort of doing your GCSEs? And are yes. there any tips you can share, please? Yeah, sure. So, um, so like I mentioned, with the um, one thing is one thing that really helps me. Uh, that really helped me, even up to now, to be fair, is um, to be very mindful of the units. So it's a good way of, you know, getting tripped up, to be honest. <laughs> so you have to be very careful of the units. So one, it, it, I mean, if you had this exam, if you had this question, for example, and, you know, you already knew how, you knew the, the, the formulas to, the formulas to be used and all of that, but you didn't have the, um, you didn't take note of the, the units, then that would be a bit of a problem. You might not get the get to the right, you know, end point with the right answer. So one thing that I usually very mindful of is that I'm usually very mindful of is you know the use of units and making sure that my units are consistent and also finding out ways to make it make sense to me. So for example, the even the calculation of you know using the fact that you know number of moles is concentration times volume even if i don't remember that if i'm not very good at maybe remembering the formulas the fact that i can use the the units as well to sort of you know work out how that should work that how that can you know relate or to use that to check if i'm on the right track that kind of helps me as well and I know that chemistry is one of is in fact <laughs> it's one of those it's it's that science that you know this is what it happens except in this case when this could happen and that case when it could happen so it's always quite 
important for me that's how i sort of learn it as well so i try to learn the base and then try to start looking at what are the exceptions what could be the exceptions to the rule so just have like a general rule and see you know what are the exceptions to that rule that could um help as well and yeah just watching videos or just listening to things and d being able to understand how the um you know how what i'm learning is applies in my pra practical life as well in practical life um so for example knowing that because we have something like you know some soft sulfate gases in the air you know if that if we have that relating if we have that when we have rainfall with those gases in the air or even just you know excess carbon dioxide in the air that what makes it slightly acidic so that helps me as well you know practical examples help me to learn if i can relate those practical examples to chemistry concepts as well or even any other subject to be honest that always helps me as well to learn so hope that helps that helps thank you very much yeah Mary. Um, I have a question. Sorry, I know there's a question on there about something um, from Mimi about what's classified as organic chemistry. So, yeah. what's classified as organic chemistry? And then I'll ask my own question. Um, okay. So, organic chemistry, I think, is um, okay. <laughs> this is one that I I tend to always forget. But um, I, what I would say is, compared to physical chemistry, for example, where you're talking about maybe you're talking about atoms and you know the neutrons, protons, you know, things like that, or, or, or actual chemicals. Organic chemistry has to do with things like alkanes or, you know, um, so these are like things that you can find in, in matter, basically. So when you start to talk about like alkanes or ethanoic acids, these all have like sources from matter also that's plants or animals or things like that and then you start to look at what makes them up what are the derivatives you can get from them and you know just looking at the chemistry behind that i think that would be how i would classify organic chemistry as opposed to and then physical chemistry obviously then or inorganic chemistry goes into like the in-depth of you know what is what is in an atom and you know physical other chemicals that you might not necessarily get from matter basically is what i would say so organic chemistry has to do with anything that has carbon and hydrogen and any of the derivatives as well so hope that helps i'm sure it does there's an interesting conversation going on on the chat to uh uh it having carbon in it and, yeah. and it totally trying to kind yeah. of break it down to us but um to someone like me that hated hated <laughs> really hated chemistry um you know i found the um where you have the experiments even yeah um really interesting can we get like a list of um those things that you put together to show the differences between the acids and the bases can we get a a, a thing where we can share with people like myself so maybe we can try it at home yes <laughs> even now and see how it all works <laughs> Absolutely. I think, um, oh, I would have actually added that as a, I can add that as a, I've got like some further learning. Um, I mean, here, further resources. I mean, if anybody that is, you know, obviously trying to get into GCSE chemistry can always look at videos. But as well, I, I in preparing for this, I found some really amazing um what's it called like videos as well on like different things you can try out and even just preparing for the the um what's it called i was so excited oh my god this is like pink colors this is green and all of that so yeah definitely i can put that together and you can test it in all sorts i mean i just pretty much took what i could find um around the house you know bearing in mind as well the um restricted you know movements and all of that but yeah you know if you've got lemon juice you know you've got you can try toothpaste shampoo and all of that and it's very easy to make i mean i'm still going to have the rest of my cabbage actually so <laughs> that's fine as well yeah i can put that together definitely and like you said because it i mean you might not necessarily be able to I, I mean it might not necessarily stick for i know for myself as well sometimes it doesn't stick if you know i'm just being talked at told you know acids have a ph less than seven or bases have a ph greater than seven and all of that but when i see these colors they kind of you know help me and reinforce the learning so yeah definitely thank you yeah thank you thank you um i do have one more question though <laughs> 
um, the question is about like um, when you go into shops and you buy soap, for example, yeah. um, or shampoos or even uh, uh, body wash and stuff like that. Some of them say that they are um, the pH balance and all that. They always talk about pH balance and uh, do, do you, can you tell us what that possibly means based on acids and bases? Um, they say oh, they're pH balance, so they're good for you. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, mean, I can't describe it more than that, but that's yeah, <laughs> that's something that's always been interesting to me. Yeah, so I think with so with um, so with um, soaps and all of that, yes. So sometimes I think what what I would say is that for the body it's very like when we talk about these things in our bodies and all of that it's very we need to the, okay so when it comes to the body the chemistry of the body we need to be we sort of don't want something that would take the ph you know really up like really high and things like that so for example i think there's a i'm not sure what it's called now but there's like a stomach condition basically so if we keep eating some sort of foods that you know produce gases then this, there's like lots of acidic acid or acid reflux. I think that's what it's called. But I mean, don't quote me on that, please. But yeah, so with the body, we kind of need to be, you know, quite uh, mindful of, you know, the pH uh, or even other chemical, um, other levels as well in the body. So I would imagine, I haven't really heard of that term, I'll be honest, or like with um, shampoos and all of that, but I'll imagine that what they mean by that is that, you know, it it's, there are some things in the body or they are quite mindful of the fact that you know we have to have the ph of or the so acidity of or alkalinity of our bodies you know quite in a balanced state so for example when we go out and you know we have you know smoke we get you know we get we get assaulted with all sorts of things when we are out and about you know bearing in mind pollution smoke and all of that so all these things as well contain gases and you know like we said as well these gases when they are dissolved in water sometimes they could affect the ph of our body or you know and again the skin and we know that the skin is like the largest organ of the body so i'd imagine that a, a soap or a shampoo that's asked that at that claimed or that says that they're going to you know balance the ph even our hair as well you know it's quite important that you know we don't we don't um, raise the pH of our hair too much by maybe using very harsh shampoos as well. So, for example, when we ha use very harsh shampoos, they're not we're not able to. It it doesn't help with the hair growth because there are some you know there are some p there are some the, the body is able to regulate itself as as I would imagine you know to an extent. But then when you when we start maybe if you're using a pH a, a shampoo that has a very harsh pH, for example, and we keep using that maybe every two weeks or something, we're bound, we're bound to see the effect on, on our hair at some point, if that makes sense. So I think I'll, that's what I'll imagine that, you know, they have some sort of chemistry inbuilt into that, into those products that would help, you know, realize when maybe your hair is too, I don't know, or your skin is too, you know, acidic and, you know, try to balance that out. But um, I I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I know too much about that, but I'd imagine that's how it goes. Yeah, hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Uh, there's uh, two more questions on the chat. Um, one being, uh, can you tell us about? There's two questions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your role and how you came to industry? And then um, there's another question about how relevant is chemi was chemistry. To your chemical engineering degree okay yes um so i would say that um safety um so i currently work as a safety engineer and um so it could be like basically with um oil and gas systems or transportation systems as well so depending on what she says at the end over oh, okay anyway <laughs> i'll just continue um so and that's basically how I came into industry. So I did an undergraduate degree and then I also did a master's degree and I was able to get into working as a safety engineer. Um, how I came into industry. I, yeah, I applied loads <laughs> and then I was, you know, I was able to get a job and, you know, network with 
people and obviously joining EFB as well has really helped me to sort of open my, you know, horizons and see what else I could be doing to improve myself as well. So I hope that answers. And how relevant was chemistry to my chemical engineering degree? So this is actually something that I say a lot. Um, so a lot of people think, okay, because it's a chem because it's a chemical engineering degree that you need to be really good at chemistry which to an extent is is true but i would say maybe even physics and mathematics was one of the things that made more or that had more of an impact or more of a um more of a that played more of a bigger role in my chemical engineering degree um i mean obviously you need to understand the the chemistry behind maybe a reaction or whatever it is but um in for chemical engineers would we'll be looking more into maybe designing the vessel in which that reaction is going to occur and so of course you need to understand the chemistry you need to know what maybe if there are any gases that are going to be produced what impact does that have on the material or even if you're talking about the safety as well but in terms of there are also some concepts in physics and in math so for example understanding maybe things like diffusion understanding things like conduction convection and things like that so which are physical principles as well things that you learn in physics and you know mathematics as well in designing in designing that you need to know how like mathematical principles that you need to use in designing all these um, um operations and all of that is I think it's quite important. So in, in a nutshell, if I can say how relevant, it's relevant, but it's not as relevant or it's not as, it doesn't play as big a role as people normally think it does when you say, oh, chemical engineering. It means that you must be a chemistry guru. But yeah, I think that answers it. Okay. Any, I don't think there's... Yeah, so I think Tolu says I tend to get acid reflux when I have too much melon, lemon. Exactly, because you have like, because it's highly acidic. Especially, and that's why, you know, even they would, they always, um, we're always advised to sort of maybe dilute it so you don't have too much of it. And that, so maybe using one teaspoon in like a big jar of water or something like that. So yeah, that, that always helps. Yeah. Um. I think I think that that was a great session. Thanks, Titi. Thank you very that, much. That, that was amazing. Um, for if you have any more further questions, you could um, um, send us an email, and I'm sure um, we'll be glad to answer you. Um, for anyone um, next week, um, forms will also be sent out regard, um, regarding feedbacks as well. Um, if you go into feedbacks, um, please let us know. Um, feedback, um, comments, and insults are welcome um for next week <laughs> for next week uh, we've got uh, an amazing event again uh we've got um transforming fears and anxiety into opportunities uh with the all um covid 19 um, currently going on um we've got amandine a special speaker who's really going to be briefing us and giving us an, an insight about how we could actually uh, you know transform our fears and anxiety um into opportunities um that'll be next wednesday and in two weeks time uh this is one of my favorite topics i've been getting a lot of whatsapp uh, messages of my mom about corona alleged and 5g allegedly um causing corona so um nick here would actually be um giving us a, a discussion regarding this it's called the five g's of radio debunk debunking the myths um so um, this is going to be on the 29th of April. Um, everyone should sign up. Um, information regarding this will be put on the website tonight for everyone uh, wishing to join in. Um, also, you can find us, us on um, social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Um, if you could kindly give us a follow. And also, um, to, to let a lot of people know, we do have memberships as well for um, professional membership and student membership. So you could actually see on our website um, if you're interested. But yeah, uh, this has actually been a great session. Um, I think I, I do like chemistry a little bit more now, Titi. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, th thanks for everyone for joining. Have a good day, stay safe.